It is the GTN Show and welcome. Now, we're rather smug here because actually one of our 2019 predictions has come to fruition because none other than Lionel Sanders has come to the rescue on our part. He has had some changes in his camp, shall we say. So we're gonna be discussing that and any of its implications. Yeah, we've also got some new indoor options, thanks to Zwift and a new virtual full triathlon that's coming up, which is perfect for this change in the season. But then on the other end of the spectrum, we've also got news from the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, where they're having problem with the heat. Yeah, and we're also gonna have some stories about a triathlon getaway. We're also gonna be talking about some cool new updates from our partner at Polar. Plus, we'll be talking dollars with the most up-to-date prize money rankings having been released. Okay, we spoke too soon when we wrapped up our 2019 predictions a couple of weeks ago because number two on our list has just been realized thanks to Lionel Sanders. Now we did predict that he was gonna make some radical change this year, whether that was gonna be something to do with his training or his diet. Well, it seems like he's got his diet under a certain amount of control now, so it does happen to be his training as Lionel has decided that after all, he does need a coach and he's actually gone back to his old coach from 2017, David Tilbury Davis, who coached him to that that success in Kona when he finished second at the Ironman World Champs. Yeah, now after some reflection, I suppose you could say, on what by his standards was a fairly poor performance in Kona, Lionel has decided that he needs to have a bit of a think and change something. Now, as I said already, he's had some radical changes to both his diet and his training over the last few seasons, but as Heather said, he seems to have gotten his diet at least under wraps and control as far as he's concerned. But the training and racing plan, well, it seems that he needs a good bit of help there. And now would seem to be as good a time as any to do that so he can really look forward to a successful 2020 season. Yeah, so you might be wondering who David Tilbury Davis is. Well, obviously he coached Lionel in the past, but he's also coached athletes such as Kaiser Sali, uh, Matt Hansen, Corinne Abraham, Cody Beals. This is all in the past. So he's a British um, born, but actually lives in the USA and coaches pros and age group is out there and already currently got a, a fairly decent roster with the likes of Kimberly Morrison who's joined him and of course Lionel Sanders. Now talking about athletes who are looking for new coaches or just changing in direction, none other than Patrick Langer, the two-time Ironman world champion, has just announced on his Instagram feed that he's actually parting ways with his long-term coach, well long-term for four years at least, Faris El Sultan, who himself won the Ironman world championship in 2005. Now we're not sure where Patrick's going to be going with new coaching choices, but we can only assume that somebody of his caliber has probably got a good idea of where he's going to be going next. Yeah, I mean finding a coach is pretty tough. First of all, you've got to get one who's got the credentials that you want and also somebody who you're compatible with and, and is also happy to work with you. So it must be quite hard to narrow down, especially in triathlon as it's an individual sport because then it gets quite competitive as to find that coach. So how do you go about, Fraser, as a pro, finding a coach that, that suits you, that you know is going to work with your personality, that's happy to have you, that you can afford, and also, I guess, that doesn't have an athlete that maybe doesn't want you in their team as well, because that must be another part to sort of take into account. Yeah, it's, it's a good question, Heather, and I suppose at, at professional level, oftentimes it can go by sort of referrals. You know an athlete or a good friend of yours who's been coached by somebody and you might have seen how they're getting on or you might have noticed a real improvement in a particular athlete's race results over the course of a season or two, and that might have sort of sparked your interest and then you might start inquiring, or it might just be somebody that you've gotten to know over a long time. So there can be quite a lot of different factors, but one that you touched on there, as well as the cost as well sometimes it can just be whether you can actually afford to work unfortunately with a particular coach or not but there's definitely a few different things that come into play but I suppose with the advent of online coaching being such a popular tool these days it doesn't necessarily matter whereabouts in the world your coach is from because hopefully you can work with pretty much anyone that you don't need to see face to face. Type. And what happens if a coach has a top athlete already and you're a sort of rival top athlete who is that coach sort of happy to take you on with the other athlete maybe have something in their contract that doesn't like how, how does that work because it sounds like it could be a, you know a can of worms there i think you're right i mean who knows i think you, you hear on the grapevine there are rumors of certain coaches who are suggested by their top athletes you can't work with other athletes which i always think is a bit of a shame to hear because there's definitely examples in the past of many top coaches working with lots of top athletes simultaneously and finding a way to make it work Thinking of the likes of Siri Lindley, who was coaching Marinda Carfrey a 
alongside somebody like Leander Cave, and they were two very, very good athletes at one particular point. So there's definitely um, precedent for it working. It's just whether the particular coach or athletes involved are happy to make yeah, it. Yeah, and I guess a national federation set up, so mm. for ITU racing, you know, you have your national coach a lot of the time, and you're all racing for, you know, that Olympic slot, which is even more pressure, and you train in the same squad. So Absolutely. I guess it's, yeah, it's a slightly different um, you know, idea in, in that sense. But anyway, bring it back to Lionel, who started this conversation off. We're going to look to next year, and it brings us on to this week's GTM poll. Do you think that Lionel Sanders will be back on the podium in Kona in 2020? A simple yes or no. You can enter that by clicking on the link just up here. Now, that leads us on to the results from last week's poll, where you and Mark asked the question, would you prefer to race on natural energy gels? And the results are pretty resounding, aren't they, Heather? Because we had 78% of you say, yes, you would, and that left the remainder as a 28% say no. So quite a shift there. Yeah, it maybe shows that there needs to be a bit of a change in the market. So hopefully, with enough demand, we'll start to see more natural energy products out there. But um, I think there was a lot more who were keen to use natural energy when it comes to fueling for training. But when it comes to race day, the ease of the gel does tend to come above potatoes yeah, or whatever else. That's a good um, point. Other options Weight and Yeah, but it's um, definitely, definitely interesting to see and great to see that people are keen for natural products. So now we're moving on to our try news and there was a slightly humorous story that caught our eye that we're going to start off with just now because there's a criminal in Florida managed to utilise, shall we say, some triathlon multi-sports skills to evade capture for quite a while but eventually thankfully he was caught and you've got some of the details right? Well yeah he started off um, this criminal was was being searched for by the police in Florida and he was spotted on his bike now this is on the first day and apparently he managed to get away somehow on his bike anyway the next day he was caught again on his bike managed to ditch the bike and then run this isn't a made up story it does come from a news article I promise um, and then he reached a lake it's like some <laughs> kind of far fetched story so he started to swim um, and apparently the police actually had to get a sort of hovercraft of sort to manage to catch him and they did manage to, to eventually reel him in but um, that's some yeah where triathlon skills come in handy maybe so as we mentioned on the show last week, the Ziff Triathlon Academy is just about to get started. It opens on Monday the 11th of November and you can sign up already. Now keep an eye on our GTN social channels because there are several group workouts throughout the academy and I'm obviously signing up and doing it myself and I'm going to be doing some of those and we'll do our very best to share when I'm going to be on so you can come and join me on Zwift because I certainly need any extra motivation I can get so keep an eye out for those. Now it's still sticking with Zwift. There is an awful lot going on on the platform in November or should we say Movember because many of you maybe are familiar with the Movember Foundation which is a charity supporting the prevention and cure of prostate cancer amongst other men's health issues. Now Zwift have very helpfully stepped up to the plate here to support people, well mostly those who aren't able to grow moustaches in the general way that Movember is supposed to be um, publicised I guess and not all of us can actually grow a moustache in the month of Well November. I can't phrase it but I reckon you might be able to beat me. I think you should give it a go this month. So the fact that Zwift has stepped up, <laughs> thanks Heather, Zwift has stepped up with the ability to do some cycling and running on their platform to try and help raise awareness and some funds is a pretty cool thing we think. Yeah and it's really easy to do, you basically log on this month and I think there's a link to, to sign up for Movember, it doesn't cost you anything, nothing you have to do and you get some kit and as you progress you get, the, the kit actually changes so there's some mo motivation with that, <laughs> oh god I've got Movember on my, on my brain now, um, and you only have to do 9.9 .9 hours because there's probably 9.9 .9 million people people affected with prostate cancer around the world each year. So 9.9 .9 hours of either running or cycling, it doesn't matter which, it can be a combination of both. And if you do both, both your avatars will get the kit as well. And then once 10,000 people in total have completed their 9.9 .9 hours in the month, Zwift will donate $25,000 to the charity. So it's a pretty cool um, incentive to get training this month. I think I can manage 9.9 .9 hours. Yeah, even I can, I reckon. So moving on to one of our channel partners, Polar because they've had quite a number of things updated with their watches over the last few months. Most notably some new software for both the Vantage V and M watches as well as quite a few funky new colourways that you might have spotted us wearing in our vids of late. Yeah so the Vantage V now comes in the, the black and the white that originally did the green and the latest edition is a blue and then the Vantage M which is the one which I actually wear the most of that comes in a white, a plain black, um, green and blue 
and now it's this black one with a copper rim, which I quite like. So, but apart from the aesthetics, which obviously are not the main reason for having a watch, they've had lots of updates to the firmware, quite a lot on the recovery side of things and the sleep. So you can now analyze your sleep afterwards. If you wear your watch at night and you can, it tells you how long you've slept, what interruptions you've had and things. And also it gives you an indication for your recovery. So that's great knowing what training you might be prepared to do the next day. There's even an app to help you with meditation and breathing called Serene. So there's quite a few things going on. Yeah, and there's also the option to choose which satellite system you actually want to link into, which I mean, I'll be honest, neither of us have managed to do, but that sounds quite impressive. You also, more, in, uh, more interestingly, I think at this time of year for us is the addition of a constant backlight because if you're out running at nighttime, it's a real pain trying to see one of these screens. So that I think is a really useful addition for sticking to paces or just looking at your rep times and effectively giving us no excuses. <laughs> yeah, there's several more updates, but um, I think if you're interested, go and have a look yourselves. It might sound too good to be true. There is a virtual triathlon, but it does actually involve some physical exercise. Apparently it's the first of its kind and it's happening right now for the whole of this month in November. And it's been run by the USA Triathlon and they're labeling it as time to try. And their idea is basically to get new participants involved in the sport of triathlon. Yeah, and it's entirely free to enter. And there's an incentive of a $20 Roka gift card once you've completed it, which does sound rather good, doesn't it? But unfortunately, you do have to be uh, an American resident for this to work just now, but hopefully in the not too distant future you might see other federations like perhaps our one um, kicking in with this program because all that you actually have to do is swim, bike, run your way through a sprint distance or indeed an Olympic distance triathlon. You've got the next few weeks of the month to do it, so you've got plenty of time to get in there, upload your data or even manually upload it if you don't have a link to a Strava or some sort of account like that and um, effectively it's just going to try and raise the level and try and get awareness of people doing a little bit more swimming, biking, running from all backgrounds. Yeah, I must admit, I mean, I don't think I was their target audience, but I did try and enroll <laughs> and they discovered that I do actually live in the USA and they realised that, sadly. But it's a pretty cool incentive and hopefully it'll get more people doing our sport. Now, it's coming to the end of the season where lots of athletes are going to be reflecting on their performances, but we suspect there's going to be a few of them are going to be counting their winnings as well. Yeah, if you look at the top 10 of the prize ranking, or the prize money ranking list, it is dominated by ITU athletes. And that's slightly affected on the women's side by Daniela Reef not having her sort of optimal performance at Kona, which has dropped her down because she was on the top spot last year and would probably have been again this year. She's down in second, but it's Katie Zafares, the ITU athlete, who's way out on top, who's earned about 200, or just shy of 250,000 this year. Lucy Charles is in second, and then Anne Hag, but then it comes back to all the ITU athletes. You've got the likes of Georgia Taylor Brand, Jess Learmonth, um, Taylor Spivey, and um, Rachel Klamer, who all make up that top 10. Yeah, it does seem that there's an awful lot more opportunity for those athletes to really sort of bolster their prize winnings. So, I mean, for example, an athlete that I was quite shocked to see only in 11th place, Holly Lawrence, because she's had an outstanding season by her own stat, well, by anybody's standards, but certainly yeah. by hers, because she won multiple regional 70.3 championship races, four, I think, in one season. Plus, she came second at the Ironman 70.3 champs in Nice. So you would think that, that she would be quite a bit higher up, but in fact, she's only 11th. Yeah, well, on the men's side, it's a similar pattern. Again, ITU athlete on top. It's Vincent Louis with, I think, $189,000 um, he earned this year. Jan Frodeno in second place. But then only three other long course athletes make it into the men's top 10. And again, the rest are ITU athletes. And with the new addition of the likes of Super League races for the short course athletes to focus on, there's definitely more prize money on offer. But as we roll into the 2020 season, we're possibly going to have an even bigger prize on offer than these prize purses because, of course, it's the Olympic year. And athletes who are focusing on doing really well at the Olympics are perhaps going to race less often. And we might just see a little bit of a reshuffling in that prize ranking list. Staying with the Olympic focus, there's been some news come from the organising committee out in Tokyo. As we've already talked about on the show a few times previously, the concerns around the heat mm. that's going to be in Tokyo in August next year. Well, the International Olympic Committee have actually had to um, admit the situation that they've got on their hands there and the heightened concern for the athlete's safety and health as well with the heat and they've actually had to make a few changes. Yeah, so following a raft of discussions about whether they're actually going to entirely change the venue for the racing, what they've opted for is just to shunt everything forward an hour in the mornings, meaning that the individual competitions are now going to be starting at half past six in the morning and then the mixed team really will start at 7.30, which will just hopefully mean they beat that real severe heat in the middle of the day. Yeah, and you might have remembered 
over from the test event, which they held in August, and the reason for a test event is to actually see what these um, situations going to be like. And for the women's race, they had to half the run of the Olympic distance down to 5K because it was so hot. The men's race, though, managed to still stay at the full distance. Yeah, in fact, other sports have had to adjust their times too. The equestrian uh, competitions are going to be starting earlier in the day than previously planned. But actually, the marathon and race walking events are having to move completely. They're no longer going to be in the greater Tokyo area and they're moving north to Sapporo to just try and beat that really extreme heat. Yeah, well, I think triathlon will be relieved to know that mm -hmm. they, at least that it's being recognised and some changes have happened, but they still get to stay sort of really in the hub of where the Olympics is at. Okay, it's time to have a look at some of your photos you sent here. We've tried to keep a bit of a balance here because we know that maybe in the Northern Hemisphere we are heading into winter and pretty much staying indoors, but it looks like some of you guys in the Southern Hemisphere are enjoying the sunshine. This first picture reflects that. It's sent in from uh, Tim, who said, um, well, under the bike description, he rode a friend's bike, hasn't told us what it is, but the pictures are of him and his workmates. So eight friends from work completed our first triathlon recently doing the Forster Ultimate, 2K swim, 60K bike, 15k run and they're already looking at the next one which is what we like to hear. Yeah I mean it looks like it's a great event well I'm being rather swayed by the fact that it's dry and dusty and just blue skies and just well looking rather nice compared to the greyness outside. Well here, a nice but... way to do your first triathlon and a nice ratio if you're um, from a strong swimming background. Yeah, that's that, how, uh... that puts a bit more weight on the swim those, those numbers don't they? Yeah not the sort of distance you see too often isn't yeah. it so um, yeah it looks like a great event. Um, next we have Jesse who's got a rather Lovely Canyon Speedmax here for us to have a look at. This is the CFSLX8 and it is coming from Canberra in Australia. It's another Australian picture. So. Yeah, he says, stoked to take this brand new puppy for a 90k spin the morning after putting it together. Well, that's only going straight in for a big ride, isn't it? If you've just put it together. I love it and can't wait to rip up some Bitumen with it next season? Bit bitumen. Bitumen. Tar oh tarmac, the road. Tarmac, <laughs> okay. Tarmac asphalt. Bitumen's new to me. <laughs> but um, it does look very slick and fast indeed. Yeah, I think Mark Sorry. would be equally impressed given that he's got one of those canyons as well. I think in a slightly, well, it's definitely in a different colourway, but no, very, very nice bit of kit. Moving on to a pain cave now. We've got a very interesting looking set with all sorts of good bits of kit in there from Helder, and they've sent in their Diamondback Serios, which is all set up indoors in New Jersey in the US so there's an awful lot of exciting bits of kit in there to use for an indoor session isn't there? Heather? Yeah well they're referencing the tough weather outside which if you're in the northern hemisphere yeah we get you on that one for sure and if you live in the city um, Helder says it's even tougher to get out there so make sure no excuses for 70.3 training for their um, half Ironman next June yeah, which that's... I'm super impressed that you've already got all of this in place so um, it looks like you're certainly on track for a good race next season and with that much kit and you've got the full Wahoo kicker set up and I think the fan underneath so yeah, and totally a very trendy, yeah, very trendy treadmill as well to get straight off and do a brick workout, perhaps. Or just yeah, I think it's one of those session. curved ones. They are Does seriously like hard work. When well, the only time I've been on one. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to know a bit more about those. But great setup we've got. Awesome. Talking about great setups, this one really caught my eye. We've got another cracking pain cave. This one's coming from Mark and. What a view Mark has. I mean, look at that that he can see there looking at right out there in front of his um That's the, Gow the Gower Peninsula oh, in, my, in, I mean... in Swansea in Wales. So this is the UK, guys, if you're wondering. Yeah, um, so... But yeah, probably wise to be behind glass whilst looking at that this time of year. Certainly the yeah, way to do it, isn't it? But yeah, Mark says he's working hard trying to improve his FTP. So good effort, Mark. Hopefully that view gives you plenty of inspiration. And that's a rather sort of Swiss um, new Watt bike as well, isn't it? Yeah. Well, not so yeah. new anymore, but... Certainly looks pretty cool. So now it's time for our race news section. And first up was an incredibly fast race, which was Ironman Florida this weekend. Now it was actually a male pro only race and the equivalent female only pro race will happen in a few weeks time at Ironman Arizona. But in terms of racing in Florida at Panama City, it was the British athlete Joe Skipper who, although having raced Ironman Hawaii only three weeks previously and producing an amazing sixth place performance there, didn't seem to tire him out or slow him down at all as he carved an impressive five minutes off of what was an already fast course record to win Ironman Florida in seven hours and 46 minutes. Yeah, it was rapid. Well, he was pushed all the way by Ben Hoffman who also just recently came off the back of Ironman World Champs where he finished fourth. And it was due to that pressure being put on by Ben that I think both of them had incredible run times. Ben Hoffman recorded a new run course record in a time of two hours 36 for his marathon. 
But uh, Joe Skipper managed to hang on with a 2.39 to secure the win by two minutes over the American. Yeah, and these times were exceptionally fast, but they were also riding their bikes really, really fast beforehand as well. However, they didn't quite ride their bikes as fast as Andrew Starkovich, who led off the bike and in so doing set a new bike course record at Ironman Florida for four hours and one minutes, which is quite staggering. I really can't get my head around it. And that took him into a sole lead position right through to nearly mile 18 on the marathon, but he couldn't stave off these very fast charging duo of Skipper and Hoffman, and he held on for third place on the podium, still with an incredible time of seven hours and 56. So now stepping down to the Ironman 70.3 distance, we had the South American Regional Championships, and they took place in Buenos Aires. Now in the men's race, we had an incredible race yet again from the American Rudy Von Berg, who really seems to be stepping up at these major championship events. Most recently, he took third place at the Ironman 70.3 World Championships in Nice, and already Already this year, he's won two previous regional championships events, having won in St. George in the US in April and then in Elsinore in Denmark in June. So he really is on a roll. But he was really pushed hard all the way because former ITU long distance world championship winner Pablo de Pina from Spain made him run all the way to the line. He posted a 110 to take that win from Pablo de Pina and the Brazilian veteran Igor Amarelli took third. Well, on the women's side, it was also a strong start for the Brazilians, with Pamela Oliveira having that strong start that she's known for on the swim, and then held on to that lead for, on the bike and into T2 and out of T2. She had a decent lead, but Chelsea Sodaro is an incredibly quick runner, as we know, and she soon ate up that deficit and ran away with the win to take the win, actually by 10 minutes ahead of Pamela Oliveira, and then third place, went to another incredibly strong running performance. Mm. And that was Tamara Jewett, who posted a 117.57 half marathon that was the quickest run of the day to finish third. And now for 70.3 Los Cabos, and it's back to the man that we were talking about earlier, Lionel Sanders. Now he's had to change his racing plan rather because apparently he'd obviously hoped to be on the podium and then just to verify a slot for next year for the Ironman World Champs, but as we know, that didn't go to plan. And he's put that down to his poor nutrition strategy or hydration strategy, and just thought he'd actually go back to the racing that he really loves, his bread and butter as he calls it for 70.3. And he really did you know, put his mark on this race with a winning margin of, I think, over 10 minutes ahead of the home favourite, Francisco Serrano, who finished second, and then it was third place to Robbie Deckard. Yeah, and on similar terms, I suppose you could say, in the women's race, because we had Marinda Carfrey, who was racing here in Mexico, and she too had a very disappointing race in Kona, what she didn't manage to finish in Kona, partly due to a bike crash that she'd had in her prep leading into the event that really disrupted her training and then how she felt when she was racing. So she seemed to want to sort of right the wrongs of that race and get a good result on the boards here in Los Cabos, and she definitely definitely did that. She came off the bike with a slight lead of about a minute or so on the other girls that she was racing, but she took a commanding lead of um, up to four minutes, which she crossed the finish line with to take that win here in Los Cabos. Second place went to U Commander from Poland, and in third place we had a local athlete from Mexico, Adriana Crena Cruz. Moving down a distance now, we're at the Olympic distance because this weekend it was the Noosa Multisport Festival in Australia. And this is one of, if not I think, the biggest multi-sport triathlon events in the world. And this is the 35th running of the event, so there's an awful lot of history there at this race. And records were broken yet again at this race, certainly in the women's race, as Ashley Gentle took her seventh title at this race, which is an enormous deal in terms of Olympic distance racing, especially in our home country of Australia, because she broke the record of number of wins of the great Craig Walton, who used to just be revered in Australian triathlon scene. So yeah, she really did do an incredible job. She took the win ahead of Natalie Van Kurvenen in second place. And in third place, we had fresh off of, or maybe not so fresh, Ironman Hawaii result, um, Sarah Crowley in third. The men's race was a close affair with several returning champions actually battling it out. And even though it's a non-drafting race, there was not that much separating the guys as they head out onto the run and it didn't, turned into a running race. There was the likes of Aaron Royal and Jacob Burt were some of the previous winners. Then you had Commonwealth champion Henry Schumann also in the mix. And it was Jacob Burt Whistle and Henry Schumann who ended up being pretty much head to head for most of the run. But Jacob Burt was in front of a home crowd, managed to have the stronger finish to take the win. So then second place was Henry Schumann and Aaron Royal also in front of his home crowd finished third. Now it is our caption competition this week and we've got a picture here from the Miyazaki World Cup last week in Japan and well there's 
Bit of a strange going on here, isn't there, Heather? I'm not really sure which way I'm supposed to be looking. Is it right to left or left to well, right? Well, I must admit, when we first looked at it, it was very confusing, and then we soon realised that, as most of you guys have as well, it was an Australian exit. So obviously, the swimmers having to come out the water and go back in, but that doesn't make it very fun for captions. So we've got <laughs> some far better suggestions rather than what actually happened. Quite a lot along the theme here that Aaron Vells came up with. Shark! Um, yeah, lots along those lines. Um, another one here from Philippe um, Stranisa says, nope, nope. Too gold. I'm with you on that one. That would definitely be me. Uh, yeah, and then we've got Sam Hellebrecker who said, something's touched my food, yeah. something's touched my food, That'd something's you, touched my food, something's touched my food. Yeah, well, never mind. Yeah, I, mean, I think it might. Yeah, I can, I can um, but we've got two very close um, sort of, well, the last two now to choose between, and it was pretty tough to decide, but our final runner-up is Kim Jarkow, who comes in with the suggestion, just practicing my open water starts. I am a backstroker. <laughs> I quite like Maybe that one. Yeah. Our winner comes from Marco just neck who says these mirror goggles seem to not be working the right way so well done to you Marco you're getting a cap so get in touch with us so we can get that off to you and for your chance to win a cap in this week's competition we have this photo for you here from Ironman Florida yeah now this looks like some athletes just getting ready to warm up before race start from Ironman Florida an absolutely beautiful sunrise coming up there so please let us know what you think would be a interesting caption get them down in the comments below and you you could be winning yourself a cap. So that actually brings us to the end of the show, doesn't it, Heather? So hopefully you've enjoyed it, but there are some good videos coming up on GTN this week. We've got one in particular that I'm looking forward to with Craig Alexander, and he's gonna be giving us some of his run tips. Yeah, and if you're after a little freebie giveaway, plus obviously some interesting new product, then there's a video of an on-shoe unboxing coming up. But if you've enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up, like, and hit the globe to subscribe to get all of our videos here at GTN. And if you want to watch a video that's gone out recently, we have triathlon mistakes with Joe Skipper, who we've talked about already on this show. Yeah, and another one that you can watch, which is interesting, on a run tips theme, comes from Cameron Worth, and you can find that here.